everyone to our evening session for uh, our Global Leadership Forum. Uh, I see the attendance is everyone's loading in. Um, I trust everyone had a great day. I trust you were able to tune into our morning sessions. We had a, we, we had a great time earlier today uh, where we, we, uh, we started our event off uh, and went through the first half of our uh, Global Leadership Forum today. Um, we heard from Jide Modidi, we heard from Leslie Pitt, we heard from April Ripley, uh, we heard from Yemi Akinsin Waju, and then we heard from Bimpi, uh, Bambosi, Martins, Leslie Pitt, and Charissa Monroe in our panel session. And tonight we have another panel session coming uh, to, uh, well, going, that you guys are going to be a part of, um, and that's going to feature. Uh, also members of our organization, Dr. Pastor John Petit Ferrer, he is, he hails from the uh, country of Haiti. Charlie Masala, he hails from South Africa. Hubert Edwards, uh, he hails from Jamaica, but currently living in, in the Bahamas. And Simpan, Mandla Zondi, he also hails from South Africa. Um, so again, I wanna welcome everyone uh, to our event this evening. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, this is this is the panel discussion tonight. So if you have any questions um, uh, for any of our panelists, you can feel free to uh, put in your questions in the question and answer box. For those of you that are on Zoom, you can put your questions in the question and answer box. And those of you watching from YouTube, because we're also streaming live on YouTube right now, uh, you can put your questions in the chat box and we will get those as well. All right. So. Just a few more minutes, we're going to allow others to load in. I, I hope that uh, you guys um, were able to attend our sessions earlier today. If you, if you weren't able to attend, uh, just know that we will be making all of our sessions available. Um, we're, we're recording everything. So once we're done, we're going to edit down all of the sessions and then we're going to post them uh, to our social media pages so you guys will have uh, the ability to watch and listen to everything that we have gone through and covered throughout our Global Leadership Forum for 2020. Uh, you'll be able to listen to those uh, once, we're, once we're done, okay? So again, good evening um, to everyone. Trust you had a great day today and you're about to experience an even better evening because you've decided to join us and I, I just hope that you get, uh, are able to gain something positive um, from this talk that we're about to have. The topic that we'll be uh, discussing this evening is resilient leadership in a changing world. And we're gonna be talking about the effects of civil and political differences. Uh, I think it's a very relevant topic, just you know, based off what we're all experiencing uh, in all of our countries around the world uh, with, with the uh, civic issues, the political issues, the differences that we have in those spheres as well, the differences that we have in as individuals with our beliefs, uh, with our way of doing things, you know, with our way of life, um, all of these differences. This this is a, the discussion that we want to have uh, this evening, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm excited about the uh, the the speakers that we have, the panelists that we have, and I know you guys are going going to be uh, going to be blessed. Um, so real quick, you know, if you have some time, so if anyone wants to just kind of shout out where, you, where, where you're from, you can leave that message in the chat box. And I'll give you guys a shout out. Uh, just waiting on a few of our panelists to, to enter. Um, hopefully they enter sometime soon, sooner than later. Uh, but uh, we have someone from Atlanta in the US. Uh, what's up? Uh, man, we had we had uh, persons tuning in earlier today from all over the globe. You know, there was someone from Australia, someone from Accra, someone from uh, where we see some people from Europe. I saw people from the UK, uh, obviously the US, uh, even parts of, of the Caribbean as well. So I just want to thank everyone. Uh, we got someone from New York, um, PNJ. Is that Papua New Guinea? Is that with PNG, sorry, PNG, PNG, 
That's what it stands for, Papua New Guinea. If you're from Papua New Guinea, oh yes, earlier today, you're definitely correct. We had folks from Papua New Guinea. And the crazy thing about Papua New Guinea is it's a 12 hour, 12 hour difference in time. So if it was nine o'clock uh, AM, it was nine o'clock PM, uh, their time. So it, uh, it's a crazy time difference for sure. Okay, so we had folks from West Africa. Um, we have someone here from Alberta, Canada, welcome. Someone from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Welcome to our 2020 Global Leadership Forum, our evening session. Um, I, I thank everyone for taking the time out to join us this evening. Um, and I hope that you guys are going to be blessed by what you hear uh, throughout, this, uh, throughout this evening. Okay, so just, again, just a few more moments. I'm gonna give our, um, our speakers some opportunity to to load in. And once that happens, we're going to get started for the night. I want to, don't want to keep you long. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, you know, all of us have uh, responsibilities, you know, with family and all of that. And this is uh, a regular weekday. So we want to be sensitive to that. So we definitely want to stick to the a lot of time that we have um, for everyone. Uh, wow, we have someone from Suriname. Um, good evening. How are you doing? Uh, very, very, uh, hello everyone, looking forward to the session tonight, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, oh, Ms. Ripley, you're too kind, thank you so much, thank you for your, always your, your words of encouragement. Um, it's actually one of our, our, our trustees, she's a part of our organization, just sending her well wishes. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to wait a few more minutes. Um, so while we wait, let me just, what I'll do is I'm going to introduce um, our panelists. I'll go through our, our speakers, okay? So again, I wanna welcome everyone to our um, 2020 Global Leadership Forum. Uh, this is the virtual edition. You know, we would usually do all of this in person, but because, um, we're going through this pandemic and we have all of these travel restrictions and we have these uh, lockdowns and shutdowns in our various countries. Uh, we thought it would be uh, much more easier and maybe even more efficient for us to do this virtually. So I wanna welcome you guys <clears throat> to this year's Global Leadership Forum under the theme, Self-Governance Planning for Crisis. Um, and the idea for our theme is, you know, everything that we, we go through, the the effects of those experiences start with us, right? We determine what, what happens, how things happen, what should happen, when it should happen. You know, it, it goes off of our response, the discipline that we have, the, our character, the ethics, morals that, that we uphold. Everything starts with, with us. Everything starts with self-governance. So uh, I wanna ensure that um, we focus on ourselves uh, because, you know, the world is in a, in a crazy state right now. And I, I'm sure that we all want to see better for our, our immediate countries and around the world, other countries around the world. But I think those changes starts with us. And I think it's great and it, it's good if we can, uh, if we can do that for, our, for ourselves. So I want, to, uh, I want to welcome you once again. Uh, thank you for, for joining all of us. And again, I'm going to introduce um, our speakers for us this evening. So I'm gonna start with um, our speaker, Mr. Hubert Edwards. So Mr. Hubert Edwards is the managing consultant of Next Level Solutions. He is a former senior bank executive, senior auditor and regulatory consulting manager with one of the leading big four public accounting firms and also a senior bank examiner with the Central Bank of the Bahamas. He is a fellow of the Association of Certified Chartered Accountants in the UK. He's a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Jamaica, and he's a member of the Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants, Accountants and holds an MBA with distinction from the University of Manchester. He also holds an LLB with first class honors from Huddersfield University. He lectures in a number of disciplines, including risk management, anti-money laundering and compliance and corporate governance. Hubert is also a media practitioner 
and an engaging and inspirational John Maxwell team certified speaker, coach, and trainer, specializing in leadership training and coaching. So that's Mr. Hubert Edwards. Uh, next, we have Pastor John Heder Petit Ferver. Uh, he hails from the country of Haiti. He's the founder of Family Tabernacle of Praise in Carafa, uh, in Kaifa, Haiti, and president founder of Shabak International Ministries. After, study the, after studying theology, both in Haiti and Jamaica, Pastor Petit Ferrer continued his studies in practical theology and biblical counseling until obtaining a doctrine in ministerial studies. Currently, he is a PhD student in philosophy and social change at the Oasis Institute of Higher Learning in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Petit Ferrer is the author of nine books written in French language. He is strongly involved in community, civic, and citizen actions for the advancement and development of his native land, Haiti. Pastor Petit Ferrer is the husband of only one wife and the father of three adult children. And that's our speaker, Mr. Petit Ferrer. Next, I'll introduce uh, Sim, Sim, Simp Mandela Zondi. Simp Mandela Zondi is a professor in politics and in international relations at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. He is also a commissioner on the National Planning Commission of South Africa, and he is a member of the International Third World Leaders Association, ITWALA. And finally, our, our final speaker is Mr. Charlie Masala. He was born in the rural village of Venda Limpopo in South Africa. Charlie Masala met Dr. Miles Monroe at a very young age. Uh, under Dr. Monroe's personal mentorship of over 25 years, Charlie would become a renowned international conference speaker and management consultant. Charlie practiced in the human resource management field for over 10 years in different capacities in corporate South Africa. Charlie founded a management consulting company, Zoe Business Consulting, in 2004. Charlie currently serves as the regional ambassador and board member of the International Third World Leaders Association, ITWALA, as well as board member for the Miles and Ruth Monroe Foundation. Charlie also served for more than a decade as head of the Macedonia International Bible Fellowship appointed by Bishop Kenneth C. Ulmer. As a management consultant, conference speaker, trainer, and facilitator, Charlie shares insights that add substantial value to any organization. He tackles subjects such as diversity management, leadership in transforming societies and organizations, teamwork building, uh, building organizational brands, mentorship, employment, equity, discovering your purpose, labor relations, entrepreneurship, youth development, and leading change. Charlie is the husband of one wife, Zoli, and father of three girls, Zoe, O'Connor, and Adisa. And those are our panelists. So I'm going to uh, welcome all of them into uh, our session this evening. Um, I want to thank all of them for joining us, and we're going to bring them in. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing this evening? Please say hello to our, our guests. Please unmute your mics and let's, let's, let's give our, everyone who's watching, let's give everyone a greeting. Good. Hello, hello everyone. Hello family, glad to be here. So how's everyone doing? How are you guys doing this evening? We are doing exceptionally well, but God's grace. Awesome, awesome. Um, good. I see. I see. Zondi is halfway here. Uh, I don't see his picture. I mean, I see his picture, but I don't see him. Um, so hopefully, he will be joining us soon. Uh, but gentlemen, thank you for accepting to be a part of this uh, this discussion. Uh, I think we just had Charlie who is joining. Um, I know that uh, this particular topic I wanted us to discuss tonight. I, I chose you guys specifically because of um, your background, your experience in a lot of the areas that deals with uh, civic and political uh, uh, situations and, and ordeals. And I know that uh, you guys will uh, lend your expertise to us uh, on this subject. So, so thank you guys. Okay, see, uh, Professor Zondi, how you doing, sir? How you doing this evening? Can you hear me? 
is muted. Professor Zondi. Okay. I think he's. I can hear you. Yes. Okay. There you go. How are you doing this evening, sir? Uh, all is fine. <laughs> okay. All good. 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 Welcome. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's right right now it's uh it's it's 1 20 a.m in south africa so zondi and Charlie <laughs> are joining us at a very late time that they're used to uh actually doing things so i i, I appreciate their uh, their commitment to this organization and everything that we're doing and making that sacrifice to join us in the wee hours of the morning <laughs> in south africa appreciate that not a problem at all not a problem yeah. at all thank you <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to get started. So what I'm going to do, so again, our um, our topic this evening is how to, sorry, is resilient leadership in a changing world, the effects of civil and political differences. And uh, again, this, this subject has a lot to do with uh, what, what we do, uh, what, what we experience in, in a lot of our countries and what we've been exper experiencing uh, lately, especially in different parts of the world going through this pandemic. And going through everything that that, that, that we've been going through. So I, I want you guys just to give um, some opening remarks on the subject. Maybe you can share a little bit of your history and dealing with the particular subject and you know just some points that you may want to mention um, prior to us getting into our main discussion. So um, I'll go and I'm going to start with uh, Pastor John. You can uh, you can go ahead. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the privilege and the honor of sharing this, this panel. And um, talking about resilience and leadership, I think um, by God's grace, this has been somewhat of a trademark for what we do in Haiti because as people, you know, um, people know, I am in Haiti, from Haiti, and Haiti has been known for a lot of turbulences, a lot of, we go from situation into greater situation. And, and uh, somehow, but the history with that is something that people need to understand. Until you understand what leads or what led Haiti to this path, you probably are not, would not be qualified to judge why it is the way it is. So you see, before we get into it, I want to share something um, that I think is critical in understanding. This is not a history 101, you know, um, I'm going to give, but I want to share this briefly. And if we were to go the, down the path of history, I have so much as I could tell, because I think even in the Caribbean, people know so little about Haiti. Haiti is just, you know, a myth for some people. And, uh, but let me say this that much, let me say that much. And uh, July 16, night, I mean, 1816, July 16, 1816, we had two missionaries that came to Haiti. It was a French missionary, Etienne de Grelet, and the second one was John Hancock. John Hancock came to Haiti on July 16, 1816. On July 16, 1816. And they met with our then Haitian president, Pétion. Pétion received them in the National Palace. They wanted the, the blessing of the government in order to be able to share or you know, spread the gospel. And the president made, had them to make a covenant. Three things he required to give them the go-ahead. Three things. Number one, he says that there must not be no French missionaries to come because, you know, we are just in a, just about 12 years ago, Haiti has just gotten its independence from France. So they didn't want under the cover of religion for the French to re come back to Haiti. So he says, there mustn't be no French missionary coming, at least for now. The second thing that he asked of them is that Christian must, at no given time, must be involved in politics or in what happened in the city. And third, Christian must always be involved in helping with education. So to this day, most places where there is a church, you'll see a little school, however mediocre it might be, but that's really, most of the schools in Haiti are, Haiti, churches are responsible for most of the school. But remember number two, Christian must not be involved in politics. And so at no given time where the church were involved in really shaping the politics or the affairs of the city. And today we have to deal with it a different way. And I'll come back with it and how the church, you know, the difference it has made now that the church is somewhat involved. Thank, thank you, Pastor Sorry, I was on mute. 
I appreciate that. We'll definitely get more into that. There's so many questions I, I, I have for you pertaining to you know your history in, in Haiti, Haiti's history in and of itself, and just the experiences you know we all experience on, on the same subject around the world. Um, so we're going to go going go, to go to Mr. Edwards. I'm going to allow you to um, give a little introduction about yourself and you know, share some views on this topic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this esteemed panel with Professor Zandi, Charlie Masala, and Pastor Jean. My background is, um, I know I'm an accountant um, by, by profession. I was born in Jamaica, grew up in Jamaica, as it relates to you know, political differences, civil unrest and stuff. I am very much aware of that, especially I remember back when, you know, as a, as a youngster, uh, one of the most famous election um, that took place was around um, the, the 80s. And there was significant upheaval because at that point in time, there was this big divide, uh, or philosophical divide between the East and the West. And there was one side which was tending towards communism and the other side which was supported by capitalistic um, countries, uh, mostly the United States. And so we find that in, in these environments, we are going to have um, significant amount of differences and persons at the end of the day don't really come together. From, from, from where I sit and my interest in this, and I have a, you know, a, from, a, from a leadership perspective, my interest in this is how leaders at the end of the day bring you know, war in factions, if you will, we can put them in quote for the time being, but bring war in factions, bring differences of ideas, bring individuals together in the interest of a country. And we are talking about this under the banner of resilient leadership. And, you know, resilient leadership have a lot to do with how the, the leader sees himself and makes his presence felt the extent to which he is demonstrating empathy and love and connection and compassion. And I, I like to, to, to think about the example which was served on the world by Nelson Mandela. And while his performance is by no means perfect, the situation that persists in South Africa, and I'm sure the other two gentlemen are more qualified to speak to that, but from where we sit, from where I sit here, it represented a, a moment in time where there is a conflation of significant issues and differences in, in ideas and ideology, and the ability for a leader to emerge who brings that level of calmness, who live, bring that level of willingness to bring sides together, I think is the really the crux of the matter. So, uh, Pastor Jean talked about AT earlier. And if you go back historically and look at AT, you will see that over time, it has been the deficit, I think, of leadership and the willingness of individuals to step to the fore and make those decision or lead by action, which is going to pull persons together. So that's really what I would like to bring to, to this conversation this afternoon. What it is about the leader, what it is about the individuals who have the ability, have the authority and the capacity to bring us together, to bring different factions together so that we can move forward and bridge these divides when we have civil and political differences. Awesome, awesome. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Edwards, for your, uh, your, your introduction. Um, I'm gonna give uh, Charlie, uh, I'm gonna get, let you give, get your uh, introduction in, introduce yourself, say hello, um, and uh, also just share, share a few points on you know, exactly how, what perspective you're gonna take uh, your conversation with us tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Miles Moore Jr as well as uh, those who are watching this broadcast. And I would like to greet my fellow panelists also, uh, Mr. Hubert Edwards and uh, Professor John and uh, my professor, 
uh, Professor Zondi, uh, who taught me, uh, you know, politics. And uh, today we we are together here in, on this panel. So I feel very very honoured, Mr. Chair, that you 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 would team me up with my professor. Uh, today I. I am going to be looking at, uh, you know, of course, I represent my country, South Africa. Uh, our problems here, you know, started uh, way back in 1652, when uh, uh, a gentleman called Jan van Riebeek and his friends, you know, landed in, 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 in Cape Town. You know, these guys are, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going around you know, with Christopher Columbus and others. And uh, when they get, they got in here, they found uh, our people who lived uh, in the Cape. And uh, they started, uh, you know, uh, sharing their ideas of what they brought here, you know, and uh, they started battering with the locals. So uh, they would, for example, you know, give uh, them the locals mirrors and when the locals see themselves in the mirrors uh, they'll be so excited because they have never seen a piece of mirror before and they will give uh, in exchange to the mirror they will give you know maybe some few cows and and and, and so forth uh, their arrival here on the on on the continent uh, you know and, and and on the subcontinent in, in south africa you know, would then cause a lot of uh, a lot of problems because as visitors would you know visitors are supposed to arrive and uh, have an arrival date and a departure date, but they really never departed. Uh, life they started a new life here, and uh, then after a few years, they decided that they were they were they were they were, they were, they were taking over uh, the migration of you know, Europeans came here and make uh, this place their, their place and colony. Uh, South Africa would then be, you know, after uh, many years would then be uh, colonized by the, uh, to the south, uh, were colonized by the, uh, by the, uh, uh, Dutch and up here were colonized by the uh, British to the, I mean, the, the northern side of South Africa. And uh, that would see, you know, a, a, a introduction of a wave of uh, protest uh, when the, the locals wanted their land back. And we see in the early 1900s, uh, the, 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 the formation of the ANC in 1912, uh, you know, uh, the idea was really to revolt against the regime of the oppressors. And through that process, uh, we see the emergence of a lot of leaders uh, like uh, King Albert Lutuli and others. And then the Nelson Mandela came uh, just after that, uh, you know, uh, level of uh, leadership of uh, the Tuli, and uh, we see then in the in the mid in the mid uh, 1900s we see uh, the the emergence the, the emergence of, uh, the, of 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 freedom fighters fighting for our land, and fast forward uh, the the 70s and the 80s will then become the the heat of the struggle against apartheid. Uh, with the tipping point in 1976, where young people would then take to the to the uh, to the streets, and uh, you know start to fight the the regime, and 1976 would then become that uh, turnaround, uh, you know, moment where a lot of you know us would then go to to jail, and uh, you know, and of course in the in the in the 60s. 60s, uh, you know, the Nelson Mandela's would went to would then be uh, imprisoned uh, for what they believed, and uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a result of that, would start fighting for uh, the release of Mandela and so on. So 1976 then became that tipping point. 
Uh, and from that we see, then we realize and started to realize the emergence of the resilient uh, leaders in the likes of Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, and, uh, and, and, and many others. That is where, you know, uh, the, the leaders of the struggle will then be uh, sentenced to go on, 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 on to jail. Most of those uh, would serve their term in, on Robben Island. And uh, fast forward, uh, 1994, after the negotiations, uh, because the enemy started to negotiate with Nelson Mandela while he was uh, in prison. And uh, 1994, then we get our, our independence. Uh, that was the beginning of us seeing uh, how resilient leader, leadership really uh, it's, it's, it's about when you see leaders come out of, like Nelson Mandela come out of prison after 27 years and, uh, and, and with all the power that he has and, uh, you know, come forward and, uh, and, 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 and forgive those who have, uh, you know, uh, caused us to struggle so much. But uh, of course, that, that is where I would be uh, talking you know, from that's a backdrop that uh, we're going to be talking from today. Thank you very much. All right, Charlie. Thank you, man. Thank you for um, for that uh, history. Actually, you know, you you, you kind of grew up and, and uh, developed through all of that. So I think that's that'll be a good uh, uh, speaking point. You know, as we move on with this uh, with this topic that we have, uh, Professor Zondi. Um, floor is yours, sir. You can give a little bit about yourself and just a few points on this topic from, from your perspective. No, no, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it, Chairperson, and uh, um, uh, and to the appreciation to the, the fellow panelists. Um, just briefly, I just want to say, uh, as my fellow panelists have indicated, uh, history is very important. Uh, history is a source uh, of lessons about what was done and what was not done. It's a source of lessons about the failures and the successes. And we gain a lot from that experience and all of that. And, and the history uh, of the people from down under, uh, of the people from the periphery, from the margins <clears throat> of a colonial uh, system uh, that has not died to this point is a rich one, uh, which is why we all get inspired by the history of Haiti, uh, the history uh, of, other, of, of other, other parts of the world. <clears throat> but the history of those who were on the margins and who were oppressed is always an important and a, a source of inspiration. Even in the Bible, uh, the, a lot of the stories of the Bible are about people and nations that were, that faced adversity, that were on the underside of history, uh, that were oppressed, uh, that, were op or, uh, that, that were rejected, that were uh, placed on the periphery, and how they use the crisis uh, to turn it into an opportunity and potential and power in order for them to run themselves. Uh, we are a people that have that are rich, have a rich history, um, though we have a poor present. Mm. Uh, we are a people that has a, a rich archive of what was done and how it was done, but that are battling with today's problems. Uh, we have a very rich history of conquering the most difficult difficulties, difficult uh, circumstances and biggest crisis in the world. But we are battling with the smallest of problems uh, today, uh, which then says uh, the history that my colleagues are talking about is going to be an important basis on which you build a resilient leadership. The resilient leadership must be the one that harnesses history and uses it, not to freeze it, not to uh, tear it into museums and look down upon it, look up, look up, look, look up to it and celebrate it merely, 
but harness it for purposes of building, of building better future. We have many great examples of those who did that and they were successful. Mm -hmm. And there are many examples also of those who are not doing that today. And as a result, we may not be successful in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Chair. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Professor Zong. And I'm, I'm going to start right where, you, right where you finished. So all of you gentlemen um, have either grown up through or you're, you know, currently live through. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to start right where, you, right where you finished. So all of you gentlemen um, have either grown up through or you're, you know, currently live through. Uh, I think we all are living through parts of it, but you know, you guys uh, are a bit older and you are more experienced uh, in dealing with, with, with these type of, of, of things. So my, my first question I'm gonna pose is to all of you guys. So what, what from your experience and what you've seen and, and, and what you've uh, learned over the years, what's the best type of leadership that is needed when there are um, a plethora of political or civic differences? Like the, the leaders that are in place the politicians, the, the, the presidents, the prime ministers, all these people that are in political power, and then you have the civic leaders. What, what, what type of leadership do, it, do, do you think is required uh, to ensure that there's a, a, a smooth relationship between those, those two uh, sectors? And then also, even within those sectors, type of leadership that is needed to help the people that they lead. You know, um, um, so I'll start with Professor Zondi. Uh, we'll, we'll just, and again, this is for each of you guys, just, uh, just your view on the type of leadership that, that is necessary. Yes, yes. I, I would just, let me just offer one uh, a specific answer to that question. Uh, for me, uh, if you look just down history and you look up to the current period, uh, resilient leaders, are those who were resilient citizens. Mm. Uh, in other words, are the leaders who became great leaders because they were great citizens. They were great persons in their own personal circumstances. And then from that, they built upon that to display public leadership. Mm. And the, the worst leaders are those who display public leadership without personal leadership, without, without having demonstrated that they are great citizens. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, Chario, one of our biggest challenges today is that we have a lot of leaders who climb up to leadership having not accomplished citizenship. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they skip the process of becoming an effective citizen in a community, become activist, work with communities, be an ordinary person without a position. Now, lead without a position before you lead in a position. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are going to tie out leadership and, and, and try and exercise leadership once they are already in the position, which is too late to learn how to lead. But great ones, I'm looking, look at all of them, look at all the ones that we know. Uh, one of the reasons why they became successful leaders is because they were accomplished personal leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, at a personal level, they were able to lead, community level, they had been able to lead. They rose up to public leadership of whatever form, mm -hmm. in the religious sector, in the cultural sector, in the NGO sector, civil society. They rose up to that on the basis of their accomplishment as great citizens. Oh, so you, so you, so basically, you're you're speaking of the importance of self governance, right? Because you can't be an upstanding citizen if you aren't disciplining yourself and training yourself uh, in that light, you know. And, and and I think that's again what the theme of this this in, this entire conference is, and it's about self governance, and and that's the importance of self governance, right? Because it starts with 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 you being able to lead yourself, develop yourself, and in turn, you know, you eventually evolve into, into leading and influencing others. Um, so great, 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 uh, great point, Mr. Edwards. Um, again, yeah. your, your view on um, the type of leaders that is required that, that uh, is able to uh, manage um, the differences that is, may be experienced on a in the political sector and the civic sector. I, 
I echo the, some of the, the sentiments of um, Professor Zandi, and I think he's perfectly right. The, the reality is that the differences which drive us apart when it comes to civil issues and political issues are usually very deep embedded emotional things. Uh, uh, you are aware, Mr. Chairman, here in the Bahamas, persons will tell you, I was born a PLP, I was born an FNM. Mm -hmm. um, and these are things, you know, you go to Jamaica, I was born a JLP, I was born a PNP. And they're very serious. These are things which are almost embedded in their DNA. It therefore means that the, the level of understanding which needs to be brought to bear to kind of bridge any divide that these things are created requires um, you know, not, not, not an individual who's going to come with an ax and chop this thing up, right? It needs someone who has the ability to use a scaffold. There is a, there's a school of, of, of leadership discussion which, which uh, refers to resilient leadership. And uh, a resilient leader is not necessarily one who has the ability to stick with it long as uh, Professor Zondi indicated. Yes, they are in it for the long haul, but the main reason that they can stay in it from the long haul is because of the personal discipline that they develop over time. I have to go back to the, the example of Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison. What is important about Mandela's 27 years in prison is the fact that it could have been shorter. It could have been shorter because he had the opportunity to take negotiated positions to move. But he said, no, this is not about me. This is about the people. Mm -hmm. And I have something here which, which says that the resilient leadership model suggests that a leader who can navigate the complexities of leadership more expertly, if he understands something about the hidden chemistry of the organizational family, so let's use it in terms of um, the country. You have to understand the inner workings of individual. And so when you find persons who can lead with love, who can lead with compassion, who understand the connectiveness and the interdependency of individual, then more than likely, they are the persons who are going to pull individuals together. Think about some of the, the great historical leaders, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, these are individuals who have a level of compassion which is not readily seen in some of the more popular leadership, which we think in this time, especially in modern time, failing us as, as countries and failing us in totality as, as, as humanity. So I definitely think it's the individual who manages himself, um, able to manage emotion and make that connection with other individuals. Those are the persons who are going to display the best level of resilient leadership. Mm. So self-management, and I, I think is this, this theme is echoing, and, and I, this kind of is the reason why I, I wanted to have this discussion, just to show that regardless of you know, where we are in, in our professional life, personal life, uh, political life, you know, spiritual life, it's all important that we are able to self-govern. You know, you know it, it's impossible for us to Poke, uh, yeah, poke, poke, point fingers at our, uh, our at our leaders when we aren't doing what we're supposed to do. Or we aren't pulling out our own weight as citizens, like uh, Professor Donnelly said. Um, so yeah, Charlie, you know your 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 views on the type of leadership that is necessary uh, uh, to manage uh, the differences from the political and the civic sectors. Uh, I I I would like to quote. Uh, again, Nelson Mandela, I think he personifies uh, the kind of a leader we're talking about today in terms of principles. Uh, he, he, he was actually, he, he, he said this when he was responding to a critique. He was being criticized of being a friend to uh, Gaddafi and uh, Fidel Castro and others. And uh, I think at the time also the, the leader of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the 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 political leader of of this group here in uh, in, in Israel, and uh, they were he was actually was being blamed for 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 being friends to them, and this is what he said. He said that uh, any leader who will change his position on the basis 
of uh, you know of, of what is convenient uh, is not fit to lead. Mm. So we need principled uh, and visionary, creative uh, leaders who are full of love for their for their countries. If you love your country, definitely you would be able to be a leader of uh, resilience and who will stand for what you stand for, regardless of what offers you're getting. So most of the leaders that we, we find these days are leaders who stand for something until there's a better offer, and then they move <laughs> on the basis of what they are being offered. And that's not the kind of leaders that we want. We want a principled uh, leadership who are able to, to, to stand and not change on the basis of who they are they, they, they are dealing with. And that is what we saw also in Nelson Mandela. As it was said, he could have, uh, you know, walked free and, uh, and, and, and be a rich man overnight and forget about everybody else. But he said, until everybody is free, I am not free. And that is, those are the kind of leaders that we need in our communities, in our countries, leaders who are not uh, willing and who are not ready to be moved uh, you know, from their standpoint of saving their countries. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, again, I, I think that echoes the importance of uh, self-governance, self-management, all, all of that stuff. Pastor John, I, I want to tweak the question for you, for you a bit. I know, uh, you know, uh, being from Haiti and living in Haiti, there's, there's, a, there's been decades of civil unrest that has been experienced there. You know, some uh, that have spilled over into um, current generations even. And I, I know that it's still issues that is being, it is being dealt with there. And if you even look around other areas of the world, you know, we have this, the NSARS issue that's going on in Nigeria. We have the civil unrest in certain parts of the United States even. Um, and, you know, all, all, all around the world, there, there's been this, this cry from the people for good governance, right? And, and they, they, they want government that um, is looking out for them, that has their best interests at hand. And, and I know that uh, Haiti experiences this as well. So what, what, what are your views or what are your suggestions to current leaders in, in, in whether political or, or civic uh, positions or sectors? Uh, how would you recommend they uh, manage or, or, or encounter these uh, uh, these strongholds within within these different uh, uh, sectors, and in, in particular, uh, the country of Haiti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to say, first of all, and I and I do want to say that I do work with some of those political leaders in those areas as well. But I would like to first of all define, you know, what is resilience really. We say resilience is the human capacity to meet adversity, setbacks, trauma, and recover from them, actually to help others to overcome them as well. So it is really resilience is a crucial characteristic of high performing leaders. They must cultivate it in themselves in order to advance and thrive. We saw that and I think Mandela is the epitome of what I'm deferring here now, you know, and but they also carry the responsibility of helping those that they lead to cultivate it themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, in dealing with our situation in Haiti, um, I what I have shared with leaders as well, and what I see from my observation and involvement with the people there is that the people need leaders who show empathy you know, um, show that they care. Um, of, I, I hope one day we get to talk about the history because so much to learn from that because we must know what role the worst of the Caribbean, the Caribbean will not be free until Haiti is free. You know, Haiti bring what are called the political or uh, liberty or freedom in that kind of way, but yet we are the other areas where we must experience freedom in order for us to be truly free. Now, when I say they must show empathy, we must show leaders that must, must show that they care. One thing that I realized in Haiti that has happened, anytime people hit the street, 
for like you know um peace protest you know peaceful walks and strikes and whatnot nobody pay them no attention no mind nobody pay them no mind after a while people learn to understand oh they don't understand peace so now they are, they are they have to they become innovative and in finding new ways to make to make sure that they are heard so now they're involved into breaking down you know riots and i don't know if you notice that um all over pretty much all over there are riots people are crying they want to be heard be it hong kong chile nigeria sudan haiti lebanon ethiopia india nigeria pakistan yemen sudan zimbabwe and the uh, the great old usa people want to be heard secondly i think they want leaders who take calculated risks thirdly they want leaders who keep a positive attitude who don't see doom they want leaders who want to develop others you know they want leaders who develop others because you see <laughs> none of us going to be here forever none of us going to be here forever and they want leaders who communicate effectively i find out that people won't understand until you speak for yourself you know like i find one of the things that people it's not that they believe you all the time but when leaders take time to address issues talk to the people tell them what it is unless you speak for yourself people are hearing others what people are saying about you and that's i find a lot of that is communication can help deal with a lot of issues i remember one time in haiti uh well the the coming together that come that great revolution in 1804 was the coming together of people who really understood you know there were this guy Toussaint Louverture as we speak about great leaders Toussaint Louverture was a, was a genius mm -hmm. and people who know anything about history will understand that and even when they took Toussaint Louverture and in 17 the prisoners while they were arresting him he said something he says when you arrest to me you haven't done nothing because my roots are deep and there are many it's all like when you're cutting the tree you haven't done nothing because my root my roots are deep and there are many and as a result you know what because to say show empathy because to say to calculated risk for example we at some point in time we were colonized by the french another time by the english another time by the spanish you see and he was the one maneuvering all of that he took calculated risk okay he show a positive attitude he developed others like Dessalines and others so even when he was when he took when the french found out that this little slave was the one playing those superpowers they arrested him and took him to a place called fort de joux in france a highest hill in france and put him in a fort naked died on coal but nonetheless although he died in fort de joux he took that calculated he knew what he was involved so when they arrested him that didn't stop that didn't stop because he developed others so that's why you said you know a lot of them came up and then you see and one of the key thing that he used before he communicated effectively these are my points that are key leadership points or nuggets that leaders must develop in order to have some sort some some sort of success right right and i i know i i travel a lot you know I, i've had the opportunity to go to a lot of the countries um i've been to haiti before i've been to south africa before i've been to jamaica before i've been to other parts of the world and there's you know i remember when i was young i always thought that other countries were um certain parts, certain things in countries were better there than it was you know in my home country um in in the bahamas and as i traveled the more i traveled i realized that you know other countries experience the same issues the same problems that uh that we experience here in the Bahamas uh I'm Mr. Edwards someone that um you're you're you you grew up and you were born in uh Jamaica and you relocated to the Bahamas now uh, to talk about those um differences or similarities or things that you may have thought would have been different uh or better in the Bahamas or vice versa or uh, things that you know you realize now man it was better um I'm not saying better I don't want to get put you on the spot but you know the the differences in you know uh living in one country moving to another country uh and your experience in in managing through those changes yeah 
you know, they say it's better in the Bahamas. So it's a blanket statement which covers everything. The it's truth true. is, the, the truth is that everything looks different based on your perspective. Everything, um, some things are, are are romantic further away you go from them. And the fact of the matter is, uh, in terms of um, uh, similarities, you you may we may be di um, discussing a difference in extent. But when you look at the concept of political tribalism, when you look at challenges with poverty, when you look at questionable leadership at national and local level, community level, when you look at the, 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 the lack of self-discipline within individuals, within the, 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 the population itself, um, there, there, there's so much which are, which are the same. Now, you know, there may be a greater propensity for violence, um, say, in Jamaica. Um, there may be, in terms of numbers, more of a particular activity in Jamaica versus the Bahamas. But for the most part, it is the same. One of the things I always say to, to, to persons that I speak to here is, you know, you need, to, you need to pay attention to what is happening in Jamaica and what has happened in Jamaica. Because in many instances, these are lessons from which you should learn so that you do not get the same um, results here. The, the, the Bahamas is a younger country. There are things that you can learn from um, Haiti, um, from South Africa, from, you know, from, from all over the world. But I find that you know, in, in the Bahamas with its greater uh, economic well-being, um, you know, the, the, the Bahamas is more progressive economically. That differentiates itself or, or helps it to differentiate from, from Jamaica such that while persons are struggling here and struggling, and many persons are struggling to survive, the struggle is not as much. And because individuals are able to, 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 to find upward mobility, less time is spent in the hustle, less time is spent in the bustle. And as a result of that, you have greater conversation. Many of the conversations that we see happening in the Bahamas, which many persons are you know, scared off to death because they think we are on the, 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 the edge of a riot. Some of these are valuable conversation. The only difference, is, well, the only thing I would like to see different is that they are harnessing such a way that they produce good results. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to end by saying, by saying this. If you go back in history, uh, I think the, the greatest upheaval time for Jamaica was when the war in faction between the JLP and the PNP. The individual who brought those two groups together was Bob Marley. There was a peace concert and he came on stage with Michael Manley and Edward Siaga, held up the both hands together. What is it which is, I, I say, comparable to, to between Bob Marley and some of the great leaders of the world. It's a level of understanding, a level of compassion, and a level of connection. In my research for, for this session, I, I, I met something which says that a resilient leader, right, lead with calm clarity and conviction in the midst of anxiety provoked by increasing complexity and accelerating changes. You hear all of that? Mm -hmm. Anxiety provoked by increasing complexity and accelerating change. And such an individual, this go back to the first thing Professor Zandi said, such an individual leader lead from strength, know how to care for themselves emotionally and physically, and can sustain their leadership efforts over time. I can't help but to always go back to to, to, to Mandela, if you think about his regime of physical exercise and the way he kept himself physically strong and mentally and emotionally strong, these are individuals who have the ability to go for the long haul. They know about self-governance, they take care of themselves. And so in the end, while there is this conflation of issues like we experience in Jamaica, like we experience in the Bahamas, a leader like that can emerge and bring warring factions together, bring dividing factions together, and get a better situation. Absolutely, oh, it, and it's it's amazing how you know there's so much similarities because everything that you said I experienced you know as I traveled for for sure. Like 
you realize that there, there are really no differences uh, between countries, right? Every country has their same struggles, same issues, uh, whether it's be political or civic or, 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 or civil issues, you know, um, it's, it's all a matter of, of the type of leadership that is there that is able to, uh, you know, pull them out of uh, the struggles. Like I, I look at South Africa and being uh, just recently out of apartheid, right, 1994. We're not talking about 40 years or 50 or 60, 75 years. You know, it's it's very recent. And I I, I want to get uh, professors on the your, your take on on how um, with South Africa being so young in its uh, independence, I guess, and or out being out of the, the stronghold of apartheid. How how has the transition of leadership uh, politically and even civically in, in some in some in some instances how has that been um, what, what difficult difficulties did you see because my, my I see a lot of corruption in a lot of our countries right from from the from a leadership standpoint and I think that also has to it starts with the person uh, and who they are the discipline that they have the sacrifices that they they go through. And when they get these positions of power, you know, they allow um, whether the position to, to take hold of them or the people around them to urge them to, you know, make these selfish decisions. So how, how has the transition in, especially in South Africa, um, been affected by, I guess you can say leaders that, that weren't trained uh, the right way or don't have the right principles in place to be effective uh, and resilient leaders? Your, your, your mic is muted. The, the, the story of South Africa is pretty similar to the story of the whole of Africa. Mm -hmm. It uh, actually could also be said to be similar to what you see in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two kinds of leadership we have, we have seen uh, in broad terms. There are leaders that are born in adversity and they, their aim was not to become leaders. They became leaders by recognition and affirmation by others on the basis of their accomplishment against a common adversity. Theirs was simply to see a point of injustice, a point of lack, a point of weakness, and try to mobilize people to address them. That kind of leadership tended to be convicted, you know, and been very clear, as, 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 as Uber was saying earlier on, uh, and all of that. But the leaders that emerged at a point of accomplishment tended to be driven by a need to harness that accomplishment, either for themselves or a portion of a people or even for the society general. But that leadership is different. The leadership that is born out of transition uh, does not have the, the force of adversity to shape its focus and its conviction as the leadership that was born in prison, born on the, on, on, on the, on the sidelines of life, was born in difficulties, born in bondage. We just have a challenge of a leadership that is born at a point of, of freedom because quite often what we've seen is that many of them aren't actually leaders uh, by conviction, but by leaders by condition or uh, even leaders by position. And that is why it is very, it was very possible that kind of leadership to be drawn by, by, by what others are looking for from it. So we have had leaders who are driven by a need to be famous, which is external affirmation. Because a need to be famous is about looking for reputation. And therefore the stimuli for whatever you do comes from outside. And then you have a different leadership that was required to be the leadership that was happen, happened before independence and up to independence, which was a leadership that was changed, shaped by character. And character is affirmation from inside. And unfortunately, you don't buy character. You don't source it somewhere. And you can't feign it, you can't fake it. If you don't have it, you don't have it. And and leaders of character tend 
tend to be able to turn down offers to entice them in any direction. Because corruption is a act of, of those who need to derail you by corrupting your principle. That's why it, is, it comes from outside. And the leaders that are driven by conviction, driven by character from inside, tended not to be drawn easily into corruption. But those that are born later, who were driven by affirmation from outside, they need to be seen to be popular. They need to be seen to be the strongest leader. They need to have the presence. They need to display your power. We're easily drawn into all manner of corruption by their need to be affirmed from outside. Because if citizens won't affirm them, the corrupt people would affirm them. Corrupt companies, those people with money, would give them that which they hunger after because their leadership is driven by a need to be affirmed from outside. And that's been one of our biggest, biggest challenges. And as a result, we have run away corruption. Corruption has taken hold in a very big way. And it involves the top, most topmost leaders. And they acquire a lot of things and they buy a lot of things and they want to flaunt it. The reason why they want to flaunt it is because they need to signal to that which gives them a, 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 a admiration, give them reputation, which will always be forces outside themselves and forces even outside their communities. And, and that derails them because even the vision changes from seeking to make a difference in the country to making a difference in the eyes of others. And those kinds of making a difference are very different. Mm -hmm. And But that has been a, a big, big, big question. Yeah, and I think you, you, you bring up a good point with, uh, with the, again, the, the, the type of, of person that they are, right? Character starts from within. And if you're looking for affirmation from others, then you're going to do whatever you need to do to get those those uh, those affirmations. So, you know, Charlie, I want to swing it to you again. You're also from South Africa, so you've you've kind of lived this this experience that you know Professor Zondi was just talking about. So, with with this corruption, and I'm I'm gonna uh, end this last question on, on this topic, and then I want to switch to um, the, the the differences in in, in our in our uh, in our in our topic for tonight. But Charlie, in, in dealing with uh, the corruption, how, how do you how do we resolve this the, the issue, this corruption issue? You know, we have these corrupt leaders, we have these uh, corrupt individuals in positions of power. How uh, how best do you think uh, we can we can resolve these issues, either by uh, retraining these leaders or replacing them? You know, what 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 things what 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 uh. uh systems, what, what devices, what, what uh, practices we can use, you know, wh whatever those, whatever it is that you think we can suggest, what, what can we do when dealing with uh, corrupt leaders? Uh, I think one of the things which has, uh, you know, uh, compromised our, our, our leadership in many countries is the lack of institutions to deal with, uh, with, with these corruptions. Uh, I think one of our blessings in South Africa is that uh, with, our, with the constitution that we have and, and the institutions that we have built uh, through, throughout the years, uh, we are seeing some, we, we are seeing some, some uh, level of uh, success in dealing with, uh, with corruption. Yes, the politicians are corrupt, but we are seeing them now. The chickens are coming to roost. In, in South Africa, for example, uh, we have this the, this commission of inquiry, uh, you know, on what we call state capture, mm -hmm. and um, th these institutions, if they are not, if, if a country is run by these powerful institutions like uh, the National Prosecuting Authority and, uh, and, and, and 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 the Public Protector and all these other institutions which are there to deal with uh, with with corruption, of course, we will be able to arrest. A lot of them, but I think solution a long a long lasting solution is that there is a there is a need uh, for for leadership training. Most of the leader what we call leaders today are just really leaders uh, because they were able to march longer, they were able to to toy toy much and uh, shout in the streets and uh, get the vote. 
but uh, not necessarily the best of our, you know, that our, our, our institution could groom. So I think uh, uh, training in, 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 in leadership uh, would go, will go, will go a long way. But we are seeing, uh, we, we're seeing that uh, the need also for uh, what Dr. Mars has been calling for, which is uh, character in leadership. Uh, you know, there is coming a time, for example, in a country where a lot of leaders are being disqualified. And of course, it pains me because these are, uh, most of them are, uh, the are black people who, whose job should have been to, 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 to ensure that we can contain corruption and ensure that South Africa can be a, a, a successful country, which is corruption free, where we are also ensuring that there is a, jobs and that poverty can be eradicated. But uh, eradicating poverty when you, uh, when you are dealing with, uh, uh, you know, systemic corruption, it becomes very, very tough. But I think in answering your question, I think in building strong uh, institutions so that, so that our governments are not personally run by individuals. There are governments where an indivi individual utterances, uh, they become law. You know, so, so, so when we have, uh, you know, these institutions and our, 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 our legal framework is uh, ensuring that those who are, you know, who are guilty of corruption can be, can be jailed, uh, we would obviously see a, a big change. And we are seeing it also here in South Africa. At yeah. the moment, it doesn't matter who you, who you are, all of them are appearing at the state, as the, at the state capture. Um, yeah, but, but, but in line with our topic today, uh, it will take resilient leadership and a political will to get those who are you know, guilty of these corruptions ending up in jail and not just a, a, an exercise, which is just a visual exercise, mm -hmm. as we have seen some, some of these uh, uh, you know, inquiries become. Yeah, and, and I think that's so you're, you're basically saying uh, we need to have some accountability, right? And, and, and uh, people who are can can be put in place to to really uh, oversee uh, these leaders and ensure yes. that they're they're doing what, what, what they're supposed to do. Um, I think that's that's that's, right. that's necessary in every country, and and, and not even in, in just you know political positions. I think even in organizations, you know, there should be some accountability uh, straight from the, you know, the head of the organization down to the, the last employee. There needs to be some accountability measures put, put in place for sure. I think that, that's a great, that's right. great recommendation. Um, so I, I want to shift, I know we have a, just we almost out of time. Um, so I, I wanted to get to this topic uh, when, when we're talking about political and, and, and civic differences, right? So the, the world has evolved, especially in, in 2020, to where we have individuals who um, have different beliefs, religious beliefs. They have different personal beliefs uh, with the, you know, who they choose to love, who they choose to marry, um, the the things that they choose to 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 do with their lives, where they choose to live, how they choose to live. Um, and and as as we uh, go into uh, future years, where I'm sure the diversity of human life is going to expand, right? And and it's, it's, it's going to be a bit uh, more difficult for, for us to define certain things because people are creating these new uh, definitions, if you will, right? Or trying to create these new definitions or redefine things that would have been defined in the past, but because of, you know, these life choices, you know, these, these differences, differences are arising. How do we deal with these types of changes, so I'm, I'm I'm talking about like religious changes. You know, you have these different religions, these these, these uh, different religious beliefs, uh, personal life changes. You know, we, we you have the um, the LGBTQ community, and I understand that there are a few more letters that have been added on uh, to that uh, as of recent. And then you have um, even political differences where. Um, countries, some countries want to go back under um, being dependent on another country, other countries want to get gain independence. How, how do we deal with this constant evolution as, as human beings um, and the differences that we all, uh, that we all experience, that we all face? 
Um, and, and you know, what do you think, or how do you think we can best manage uh, to ensure that we, are, we aren't being selfish, right? And putting or pushing our beliefs on anyone, but really trying to do his best for um, um, our, 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 our globe, our countries, our individual countries. And any of you can, can you know, take, take a, a stab at this. Uh, yeah, uh, I, would like to, I would like to take the challenge, Mr. Chair. Okay, and, uh, I, I want to get to, I, I want to make sure everyone kind of cover this, co co cover this question. No, go ahead. I'm just saying, just, just be, just try, try to be quick because I want to make sure we give everyone an opportunity. Okay. Uh, there, is, there is a statement that Dr. Miles Monroe used to uh, say, and he, would, he, he used to say that every I, 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 idea or ideology needs a theology to back it up. Uh, we have seen that even here in South Africa. Uh, horrible as it was, apartheid, uh, there was a church called the Dutch Reformed Church who were, you know, who were ready to provide the theology to justify that apartheid. Apartheid in South Africa, if you don't know, uh, it, was a, it was something which was spiritually, uh, you know, accepted and theologically accepted because they found and created verses in the Bible which which, which indicated according to them that uh, the white man was supposed to be over the black man. So I think uh, as Aitwala, as an organization, which is a leadership organization, but very spiritual, uh, we should never forget that even when we are, we are dealing with, uh, a, you know, a lot of new terminologies and new introduction or perversion, Perversion will remain perversion, whether it's have new names or other letters added to it and so forth. Uh, so I think what we need, what we need, it's uh, it's, uh, it's 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 to uh, it's to reintroduce what God has already introduced. There are principles which govern earth. There are natural laws which governs uh, how we need to live with each other. And I think if we and run to, to, to godly principles, we will be able to save our nations because everything that man is trying to do now is going to collapse definitely in our face. Mr. Edwards. Okay, thanks. I, let me take this from a, a slightly different angle. Uh, everything that you do, everything ultimately that you become comfortable with is built on your belief and belief is very important. Uh, it's important for human beings to have a belief system as a foundation. That's what, that's what Charlie just spoke about. You need a theology um, to undergird something which you may even start it out um, disbelieving yourself. And you, you know, there's some part of you which says it's wrong, but you go out and you find uh, justification for that. One of the things that we must come to grips with very quickly and very, um, I, I think with rapidity, is the fact that the world as we experience in it today, in many ways have always been like this. There's always been upheaval. And that's, again, go back to uh, Professor Zondi when he says, history informs based on what already took place. So if we go back in history, we would see times when there were these similar uprisings. So the question is, how is it that you as an individual, how is it that we as a group will conduct ourselves? And I go back to this thing, as a man thinketh. And I will use that statement, as a man thinketh, and use it as a means of boiling down everything that we have discussed so far into a stew. And that stew, I think, at the end of the day, comes down to the individual. Because while we can say as a nation thinks, me and you know instinctively that the nation cannot do anything without the individual thinking. So when we create that um, critical mass, and when we go out there and when we interact, we must understand fundamentally that what we are doing is building character. And you cannot disabuse any individual of any belief until you change and replace something which 
he already has there. You can't tell him, well, that's wrong without showing him what is right. You cannot say, well, this is not good without showing him something else. So I would think the way for us to deal with these circumstances, especially in this environment where um, being politically correct is important and there's a huge amount of sensitivity. Live your life based on principles and then understand that the character that you build will be displayed in your action and then you become an example to others. And if more of us are doing the same thing, then obviously we will have an impact on those outside of our group and the wider world. And I think that is the best way to go. Pastor John. Uh, thank you very much. The constitution of the kingdom says when the, when the good people rule, uh, everybody rejoices. Uh, when the just people rule, everybody rejoices. It's a, it's a principle unbreakable. Mm -hmm. When the righteous are in authority, people flourish. Which then says to me, Chairman, people are not flourishing mm -hmm. because the righteous are standing on the sideline or are busy saying they are praying in a temple when the kingdom process must be happening in society. Mm. <laughs> Those of us who are by virtue of who we are and as, as kingdom citizens know exactly what needs to be done in each one of our countries. Perhaps we are the righteous who must run, but how are we going to run when we run away from the processes that will get us to power? How are we going to run when we think we can shout for things, for particular outcomes from a distance with our eyes closed? And, and therefore, sometimes we sit at it and think, I'm like, like, if we were to look at it maybe from the God eye view, who does God blame for a broken Malawi? Is it not those who are in Malawi? who could see that things were wrong and had an ability to provide a solution, but did not do it. And they have good reasons for it. The devil caused it. These politicians did not give them a chance. This is that. Human beings tend to explain their inability to play their role rather than to find a way to play their role. So spend a lot more time explaining why we were not able to play their role which simply is meant to say to others, we wanted to play the role. We were keen to do it, but something, someone stopped us. So, so, so we deny ourselves an opportunity to leave a legacy for our children, children's children, and bring countries back to where they like, uh, of, of Toussaint in, 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 in Haiti, of Mandela, of Martin Luther King had built. We have abandoned the responsibility, even though we can see, we have eyes to see what needs to do, we have the gifts to use, and we have the ability to mobilize. We come from institutions that are called churches, which have, have numbers of people, the constituency, Yet, even with all those capacity, we still do not use it and harness it mm -hmm. to drive a country this way or that way. If you look at Muslims, at Muslim institutions in Arab countries, because Muslim and Arab are not the same thing. There are Muslim institutions in Arab countries. They don't sit by the wayside and let the Arabs in power move things in any direction. They harness the power of number and the power of being organized, the power of their principles in order to change things. The Christianity we got from colonialism taught us that we do not, should not be involved. We should not be in the center of things, but we must just pray. Maybe things will happen by some miracle. Mm -hmm. The corrupt people will stay out. But what we've learned from history is this. If we are not in the center, somebody else will occupy the center. There's no vacuum. So we better step up 
and do something. There are many options we can talk about, but we can do a lot of things to contribute to fixing our country so that we fail while trying rather than to failing to try. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Wow, good word, good word. Pastor John. Well, I would go by this by saying that everything rises and fall around this thing, this topic we call leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think in order for us to see results, you know, um, change to, to occur in the things that are happening around us, we need leaders with mental fortitude, what I would call mental toughness. Mm -hmm. Because we've seen throughout the scripture, all kind of leadership. We've seen Aaron, the type who gave in because of, you know, popular demand. They want to be politically correct. We've seen Saul, the kind of leadership who gave under, who gave in under pressure, you know, and disobeyed God. So we need people with mental fortitude. And when you talk about mental toughness, that's the emotional stability that it requires in leadership to, 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 to stand for something that is greater than, than yourself. As we have all know, he cannot lead a city who has not led a community. He cannot lead a community who has not led his family. He cannot lead a family who has not led himself. He cannot lead himself if he's not submitted to a greater power, which is Jesus Christ. And I would say this, it's not the water around the boat that's saying it. It's the water within. Goes back to the same thing that you were saying, self-governance. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this, again, this theme is being echoed. There's nothing that can happen in a successful way without self-governance. There's no that's sustainability right. in it. There's no longevity in it. You know, we have to be able to govern ourselves. And, and regardless of what we're going through, self-govern ourselves in, in the good times, self-govern ourselves during crisis, throughout of crisis, as we get on the other end of crisis, it all starts and ends with, with self-governance. That's whether you wanna be a political leader, a professional leader, civic leader, religious leader, we have to be able to govern ourselves. And, and I think all of you really hit the nail on the head with uh, this topic and this conversation because everything ties back to self, right? Everything that we wanna do, everything we wanna see happen, it, it really goes back to the person, the individual, as opposed to any any organized group. So uh, I want to thank each of you. Uh, we, we've gone a little over time, but I think it was necessary. Um, I, I really appreciate each of your uh, input. Um, I want to give you 60 seconds each, six zero seconds, um, just in closing, just kind of wrapping up what we thought. Maybe you just want to leave uh, an uh, encouraging word or something with, with, uh, with everyone. Uh, so. I'll give each of you uh, 60 seconds to speak, Professor Zondi, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope that we will remember this, that with knowledge comes the responsibility to act on that which you know. Mm. Those who do not know can be excused from acting, but those who know have no excuse but to act on that which they know. Mm. Thank you, thank you, sir. Pastor, Pastor John. I would say the first person you lead must be yourself, you know, and, 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 any, and, and my point is this, we all must come to that understanding that we must come to this place of nothing around us can affect us until something within us really is been affected by that. So we must understand, and it is my prayer that we come to this place of understanding that until we get to that place, we need the kingdom in order to bring that self-governance. We need the kingdom message in order to really, we need help in order to be able to self-govern. And it's only then we can affect change. And I would say like Man Mandela says, it, it, it always seems impossible until it's done. Until it's done, absolutely, absolutely. Charlie? You are mute. I would like to conclude by saying that we need help from another world. Mm. Our world is fading before us. It's time that uh, we stop looking around and we look up and get to be addressed by God so that we can address the affairs of men fully. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And Mr. Edwards, closing words, sir. Thank you so much. It was certainly a pleasure to be here with such a phenomenal group of uh, gentlemen. Um, let me end by quoting um, Nelson Mandela, and he speaks about the spirit of Ubuntu, which I think is something which is needed in our leadership today. The spirit of Ubuntu, that profound Af African sense 
that we are human only through the humanity of other human beings. It's not a parochial phenomenon, but has had it globally to our common search for a better world. It's all about the individual. I like to end my radio show by saying this, do not allow your greatness to become a victim of your unwillingness to change. Now that we know, we need to go out and do what needs to be done. Thank you for having me here. It was certainly a pleasure being a part of this discussion. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. I want to thank each of you. Thank you for joining, uh, agreeing to, to join this, this panel. And thank you for sharing your insight. I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, special thanks to Professor Zondi and Jolly. I know it's super late where you guys are, six hours ahead of all of us. I appreciate you guys taking the time. I, I, I am humbled by uh, your, your inclusion in this, uh, in, this, in this panel and everything you guys share. Thank you all very much. To those of you who joined in, thank you for being a part of this. I hope you were able to take some uh, points away with you uh, that you'll be able to apply to yourself and understand how important self-governing is. So see you guys tomorrow uh, morning. Sessions start at nine o'clock again. Uh, and uh, we'll be here with another day of good information, um, great networking, and a good experience for us all, okay? So until, until then, good night, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world.